Uh, so uh, now uh, the next session, so we have, uh, it's our great uh, honor and pleasure to have uh, Glenn here uh, from Microsoft uh, to give the invited talk, um, Plurality, Technology for Collaborative Diversity and Democracy. Uh, so Glenn is the uh, Microsoft's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, Political Economist and the Social Technologist. And Glenn has done a lot of really amazing work uh, in actually very broad uh, spectrum. Uh, so Glenn did the, uh, wrote the book uh, and uh, proposed this uh, data as a labor uh, concept uh, early on and has founded the Radical Exchange uh, Foundation. Uh, and also recently, many of you may have uh, read <laughs> Glenn's paper. Glenn is a co-author on the Soban Token, the Decentralized Society, um, paper that I think is what now one of the most uh, widely read paper. Uh, and uh, Glenn today is going to tell us more about uh, a new effort that he's starting. Great. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Don. And uh, I really appreciate being here. Uh, let me tell you about a couple of uh, new efforts and then get into the substance of the talk. One thing I should highlight is actually my title has changed from what Don said. I actually have now moved um, and I uh, just took over as founder and research lead of something called the Decentralized Social Technology Collaboratory, which I believe is the largest Web3 research group in the world, uh, partnership with MIT, Harvard, um, Protocol Labs, EY, and Han Ventures. Uh, please check it out at aka.ms slash DSTC. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to focus on today. Instead, I'm going to focus on two other efforts, a book project and an academic network that we're starting, whose first conference will actually be here in Berkeley, and I'll tell you about that at the end. Uh, and that's called plurality. Um, plurality is actually the best attempt to render into English of these characters in traditional Mandarin, uh, which mean both plural and digital at the same time. Uh, and those originate with my co-author, Audrey Tong, the, uh, digital, the Minister of Digital Affairs of Taiwan. Um, and this project is a response to what I think is um, a problem we face in visions of the future of technology today. There's two very well articulated, but I don't think very appealing visions of the future of technology. And there's another one that I think is very powerful that's having transformative effects but that is not really very well articulated. The two better articulated ones, and I drew these names from a game called Civilization VI that some of you may have played. It's the best-selling strategy game of all time, and they have future governments in it that capture these different worldviews. Um, one is called corporate libertarianism. You can roughly think of this as the like, let's use blockchains to knock down social institutions, knock down governments, and replace them with some sort of you know anarcho-capitalist uh, uh, utopia or dystopia, depending on how you look at it. Um, a second perspective is what I would call synthetic technocracy. This is the uh, AI eats the world, everyone lives on a UBI, um, you know, AI is benevolently plan everything sort of a vision. And, and these are both like quite well articulated, some of the people associated with them are up there. But there's a third vision that I think is in many ways much more powerful, much more persuasive, but I don't think it's been articulated in the same way. Um, in, in Civ 6, it's referred to as digital democracy, and I want to try to give you our articulation of the research agenda that we believe corresponds to this direction of technology, sort of analogous to uh, elements of the crypto and AI visions that have been driving the research agenda in recent years. And I think uh, one nice slogan from this is drawn from Star Trek. Star Trek is the favorite show of my co-author, Audrey, who often gives the Vulcan salute. And uh, it's infinite diversity and infinite combinations. So it's the idea that progress and truth and beauty all arise from the union of the dissimilar. So uh, how does that translate into a technological paradigm? Well, to put it simply, you know, if AI is a vision of replacing people with machines that do everything that people do better, and you know, the crypto uh, like sovereign individual type vision is one of replacing social institutions with uh, protocols. The vision here is that technology can facilitate cooperation across social differences. 
Um, and, and this, I would argue, is sort of the core idea that underlies networks. Networks are about distinct but interacting clusters of human activity finding a way to cooperate without being homogenized. Um, and this requires both recognizing social differences, celebrating, even proliferating them, but also facilitating cooperation across them. And this may sound a bit wishy-washy, but I would submit that this is actually at the very core of mo many of the scientific advances of the 20th century, though not applied as much to societies, more applied to various kinds of physical systems. So for example, uh, at the core of quantum mechanics was moving beyond the idea of kind of bil separate billiard balls hitting each other and moving instead to entangled interacting uh, particles and systems of particles. Ecology was about moving beyond survival of the fittest to uh, dynamic ecological interacting systems with elements of competition, but also many elements of symbiosis that together create uh, you know, multi-layered systems of these partially cooperative interactions. And in fact, uh, you can even think that this is at the core of science. So recent work on uh, meta-science, science of science, shows that the source of most scientific advance is the formation of distinct uh, clusters of thinking and then their uh, interaction, interactions across these. So I actually think this, what I would call plurality vision of future of technology is, is in many ways much more deeply tied to a whole range of traditions in the natural sciences out of which technology is meant to emerge. Um, and to define this in terms of some uh, principles, I think critical to this is first, the recognition of social and cultural groups beyond the individuals that make them up. Um, so you know, in an individualist frame, there are the individuals and there's the system. Uh, but in a pluralist frame, there's a wide range of different cultural communities and fostering their behaviors is critical to making the system work. Second is subsidiarity, which is kind of the equivalent within this pluralist frame of uh, what you might call incentive compatibility or monotonicity in a standard economist mechanism design frame. The notion is that there are communities who have a primary interest in some issue and that when you know, that they should be the ones who govern the decisions on those issues. This is sort of a generalization of the principle of federalism in the design of, um, of uh, you know, governance systems. Federalism is sort of hierarchical and, you know, partitional. This can be more intersecting, but it's the notion that there are local communities which should self-govern on particular issues. The third uh, is neutrality but not neutrality in the sense of neutrality across individuals or neutrality across dollars or neutrality across like nation states. Instead, some notion of neutrality that's defined on the pattern of these social interactions, the graph, graph pattern that they create. The fourth is cooperation. This is the notion that things that have diverse support and diverse meaning across different of these social groups and formations should get more support holding fixed sort of the number of people that support them than things that all get support from the same unit. So when there is many diverse types of evidence, when there are many diverse social groups supporting something, that's a case when it should get extra support relative to just a lot of people who come from exactly the same uh, social background supporting it. And the final is adaptation. This is the notion that the set of social groups is not fixed in time. It's dynamic. And in fact, part of the goal of the system is to support and foster social dynamism of this sort. Um, so uh, these are both principles of sort of methodology, like how the field approaches generating new knowledge, but they're also uh, principles of the design of systems. And I want to try to walk through some examples of systems designed with these principles in mind um, and focus especially on open research questions I see in this agenda. And I'll try to highlight especially those that are relevant to folks coming out of the Web3 world. OK, so the first example is called vTaiwan. So vTaiwan is a uh, system used in Taiwan for collaborative decision making um, on uh, divisive social issues. 
It uh, was created by something called the Gov Zero Movement, a social movement in Taiwan that uh, basically forks government websites and provides better versions of those websites and then tries to shame the government into adopting them. And um, they occupied the national legislature of Taiwan in 2014 as an extension of the Occupy movement. But this was the one case where actually they managed to come up with a set of proposals that was not just popular among the members and the broader society, it was actually accepted by the government and was so successful that in fact, the members of the movement became uh, mentors to the ministers to help them be more in touch with the public. And then when the new government came in, replaced those ministers. Um, and this uses a Twitter-like format where people submit views on an issue, but rather than trying to serve to people uh, the things that keep them most engaged. Instead, the system forms clusters of opinion based on what people think about different issues in order to represent back to a society the state of opinion and disagreement on an issue and identify topics where, or positions where people who are divided along other dimensions nonetheless agree. So it, it, it provides a system for, surf, for giving you a vision of a sort of social conversation and surfacing areas of these sort of unlikely pluralist consensus. But of course, as cool as this system is, it's also um, a, uh, just really a first step in this direction um, because it's just based on some simple k-means clustering, based on how people vote. There's no attempt to use sophisticated natural language processing but eventually we could see an extension of this sort of a system as really a revolution that's almost like broadcasting but in the reverse direction, where we're able to not just say something to a large number of people, but to hear what large numbers of people are saying so that we can close the loop and participate at scale in a deliberative, consensus-oriented, democratic conversation. Okay. Um, and by the way, this system is currently used by a quarter of Taiwan's population as monthly active users. It's resolved a number of very contentious issues, even in its extremely primitive state. So it's, it's really amazing the things that it can accomplish. And Twitter's birdwatch, we'll see if that survives, but is using uh, these underlying principles in their design. So there's a huge demand for further developing this area. A second example of this is Gitcoin, which uses something called quadratic funding that I was involved in developing um, to allocate matching funds to uh, projects. Um, the basic idea is that in an ecosystem like the Ethereum ecosystem, there's a massive amount of open source software that's core to the operation of the system. These are public goods. It's very hard to find a business model that's consistent with them having the value and impact that they need to have. Um, and so the question is, can you in a decentralized way provide public goods? And if you take a standard mechanism design framework, there turns out to be an elegant, simple answer to this, which is that if you have a central funder like the Ethereum Foundation or some people who are wealthy in the space who benefit from it all working well, providing matching funds and then individuals uh, voting with dollars on their allocation, basically uh, their, their individual contributions get matched according to a rule where small contributions get matched more than large ones, and, contribution, and projects with a large number of individual contributors get more match than those with fewer, and that's expressed in this quadratic rule, you can show that that leads to an optimal allocation of the public goods under the standard conditions that are considered in the mechanism design uh, literature. And this has become, as many of you probably know, a pretty important piece of infrastructure within the community. About $100 million have been allocated by Gitcoin alone, and then there's several other of these projects, including one that the Taiwanese government is running now. But um, again, this is just a first step because quadratic funding treats every individual as a separate sort of contribution under some square root. But of course, people are not completely separated in individuals. There's collusion, but even without collusion or sibyls or anything like this, people just have different relationships with each other. Uh, you know, me and my wife could pump the money out of a system like this by each having a separate account and then having a joint bank account. And you know, given that most of the things we buy come out of a joint bank account anyway, we would be just as happy 
uh, you know, getting money together. It's giving a subsidy to us cooperating, even though we're already cooperating in all sorts of ways. And in fact, people are connected by all sorts of webs of cooperation. People are in the same company. People are in uh, the same university. And these create overlaps in their interests that a system like this should try to account for and only subsidize cooperation across social differences. And this is a very important uh, issue in the space, and, and there's lots of really interesting work going on this, on this, including by Joel Miller from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Okay, let me give you a couple of other examples before I close of the uh, areas, again, very close to the Web3 space that I think uh, are important to developing this. So one is what we call plural publics and social data structures. And this is based on the idea that the privacy versus publicity paradigm is really a very thin representation of what we're actually interested in achieving when we think about data structures that empower people. Um, let me, just to illustrate that, uh, give an example of two things that are sort of on the median line between public and private, but that are equally distant from each other as public and private are. So one is like the secret plan of a football team that they don't want the other side to know, but all the players have to understand perfectly. And another is, where's Waldo? There's nothing obscuring him. He's floating out there, but it's hard to find because he's buried in uh, you know, a sea of other people. Um, and what this makes you realize is that like, actually what we're usually interested in when we talk about privacy or data sovereignty or whatever is a graph of co-knowledge. It's like, what is the pattern of people jointly understanding things? and being able to operate on that as an object. And I claim that a bunch of cryptographic tools are really powerful ways to get at this. So uh, let me just give you a couple of examples of that. There's a beautiful paper by um, uh, Joe Halpern and Raphael Paz uh, that shows that there's this notion, game theoretic notion called common knowledge. This is the idea that everybody knows that everybody knows that everybody knows that everybody knows some fact. This is critical for coordination in game theory. And there's a uh, elegant argument from the early 90s that no directed asynchronous uh, communication protocol like email can get you approximate common knowledge. Because um, at some point, if there's any fault, at some point the message gets lost and it kind of unravels. But uh, what Poss and Halpern show is that that can be achieved with distributed ledgers. So one key element of manipulating this co-knowledge structure is achieving common knowledge and distributed ledgers are powerful ways to do that. But another key part of this is defending collectively the boundaries of knowledge. You want to pre collectively prevent disclosure outside of a given group. Um, and you might think that that's hard. Like, how can you stop someone from sharing information they have? But one thing you can do is stop people from disclosing provenance. You can stop them from proving that information is legitimate. So as long as the information is not independently verifiable, you can limit it to a set of people who are uh, participating in this is called designated verifier proofs and I think is a very powerful tool that's being developed in this space. And I think together these allow us to move beyond just a simplistic notion of like immutability or whatever to like how do we actually use these tools to define communities and their boundaries and to protect them and lift them up. An another uh, example of something that's very important in the Web3 space that involves these ideas is what's called community recovery. Right now, we know lots of things are stuck between this sort of custodial model, which undermines a lot of the values of decentralization, and the non-custodial model, which opens people up to hacking and, in many cases, even kidnapping to get their keys. Um, social recovery is a powerful step beyond this, but it requires that you maintain a whole bunch of relationships and be sure that they're up to date, be sure that those people aren't colluding with each other, et cetera. Something that may be much more powerful is what we call community recovery, and this is actually using the stu structure of the social graph relationships as represented in things like Don mentioned, like soulbound tokens, to form a set of people who can be your social recovery guardians who are connected only through you to each other so that you're maximally protected against collusion. Um, and this is very much building off of one of the foundational ideas in sociology, this idea of intersectional identity, the notion that you're the unique intersection of your social groups um, and that that can be the foundation for uh, security. So um, I hope that this vision of where the space might go will interest many of you, and I would encourage you to uh, engage in many of the ways that are available, and I, let me call out two. One 
is that um, Audrey and I are writing a book together as an open public collaboration on GitHub using some tools from Protocol Labs and others to uh, govern it in a way that's consistent with the principles that the book espouses. And we'd love many of you to engage and, and contribute to this book. You can check that out at plurality.net or email me at glenn at plurality.net. And here at Berkeley in January, we're trying, we're holding a conference because we're trying to build a academic cluster field around these ideas uh, called the Plurality Network Conference, the Plurality Institute. And the folks that are PMing that process are sitting in the back of the room right now at that back table back there waving to you all, Rose and David Blumen. Please chat with them if you're interested and please email me if you'd be interested in attending uh, during that conference here. It's by invitation only, but happy to invite many of you who are such important contributors to this emerging field. Thank you so much, Don, um, and looking forward to getting to know all of you today. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hello. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I guess the concept of democracy has been built on one person, one vote, uh, way back when it started a couple hundred years ago. How do you see that going forward in a digital world? And let's say, how do you protect against things like civil attacks or, or the equivalent in a democracy? Yeah. So um, I think that the like basic idea of one person, one vote as a foundation of democracy basically only works when you have exogenous membership. Now, of course, there's immigration and whatever, but basically almost all of modern political philosophy is built on the assumption that we have obvious memberships. And when you're in a dynamic world like Web3, or even in a world where you want like companies to be democratically governed or something like that, you know, cooperatives, all that stuff goes out the window. And I basically think we're, we don't know where to start. And um, I'm working on this with a bunch of democratic theorists and so forth. It's a very important area. But I think that a really key concept is a generalization of the idea behind quadratic voting, which is called digressive proportionality. This is the notion that when you're making a collective decision, you want, um, you want vote to scale sublinearly with stake. Uh, and this shows up in how many votes like in the European Union countries get as a function of population. It shows up in quadratic voting. It shows up in a bunch of different things. But I think this is like a really core concept in getting beyond that. There's a lot more to be said about this, uh, and, and we'll be writing a lot about it. But I think that basically the, the fundamental concept of political equality in the simplistic sense is just out the window once you're in these complicated worlds. And you have to start thinking about these richer ideas that capture some of the intuitions behind it but that aren't uh, as rigid. Hi. Um, first of all, unless I missed it, uh, I just want to say kudos for an entire talk like this without, I think, mentioning the word DAO <laughs> at any point during a talk. That's pretty impressive, uh, actually. But I just wanted to clarify, is yeah. the intention whenever you're talking about communities and blockchains and other things that you know the representations fundamentally are using some version of DAO for every different level, or is there some other structure that we should start thinking about that is adjacent to above or below a DAO? Yeah, I mean, I I, um, I I don't really have that much clarity on what a DAO means exactly. Like the way I think about a DAO is it's just like a flexible organization that is not especially bound by the limited set of constructs that are available in the Anglo-Saxon Roman like legal canon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really understand what it is other than that. So in that sense, like it's just something very general. And sure, you know, you can you can view things in that way. It tends to have a very formal governance structure. And of course, formalism is like an important part of what we're talking about here because we're talking about scalable technologies. So they're going to involve some formalism. I'm not someone who believes that like something needs to religiously only use that stuff, though it's fun to have organizations around that tie them their hands that way because it gives us a ground to experiment with this stuff. They're going to fail if they don't use sophisticated formalisms, if they're going to tie themselves down to formalisms. So that's fun for us, though not necessarily for them. But um, yeah, I, I don't think that things have to be ultra formalized that way in order mm -hmm. to be part of this vision. But I definitely think there's a 
big role for this vision and things that choose to formalize themselves that much. So. Okay. Okay. No, that's really helpful actually knowing yeah. how knowledgeable you are and yeah. sort of your view on DAOs um, being not super well defined. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other question I had was on individuals. Uh, you also kind of didn't talk about uh, how reputation is kind of built. It was sort of more about identity and other things. Yeah. Um, you know, is that uh, a core concept in this, the idea of having positive and negative reputational, um, you know, attribute sharing and signaling? Or, you know, I'm just wondering how core in the polarity the reputation is, because at least when I've kind of looked and thought about these systems, it seems like a lot of times it kind of comes back to, you know, how you build and distribute reputational signals. Yeah, I mean, the problem I have with the word reputation is it's often meant in a very universalistic way, like there's a one vision of you, and then it starts collapsing pretty quickly to something like a social credit score. Um, what I'm interested in more is series of socially affiliated attributes, which are perceived differently depending on the context of who's able to see what and the context of, you know, uh, who interprets things in what way. So like, I'm a big believer in reputation, but contextualized and socially specific reputa reputations mm -hmm. rather than like a singular notion of a public reputation. And I think, okay. you know, soulbound tokens and DIDs and things that go beyond both of those to this sort of pluralistic information structures with communities that see certain things and don't see others in certain social contexts uh, are all going to be tools in, in building those. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, great. With that, let's uh, thank you, Glenn, for such an inspiring talk. Thanks, Dom. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much.